Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a good week. Mine was pretty good. I only worked one day. <laughs> worked Monday. Anyhow, it's hard to believe only a little over a month before spring feasts start God's master plan for mankind laid out by God's holy day plan. Of course, the first part of that plan is the Passover and the most important. Without God the Father, through the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ and Christ shed blood so that our sins could be forgiven, the rest of the plan wouldn't make much sense. We'll hear more about that in the near future, I'm sure. So after the Passover service that we partake of, unleavened bread and the wine, Christ's broken body and shed blood, we've been redeemed, our sins have been forgiven. How do we, as God's people, go forward? How do we avoid sin and continue to overcome as God wants us to? Immediately after the Passover comes the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the next step in God's master plan. Today I'd like to go over some of the symbols of the Days of Unleavened Bread that show us how we can avoid sin and go forward as God's people. Start in Exodus chapter 12, if you want to turn there, Exodus 12. Of course, this is where the Passover is instituted. Also in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 34, if you just want to write that down. Exodus 12, starting verse 14, it says, So this day shall be to you as a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. I always like reading that in the Old Testament when all these feast days are set up, how he says it's a perpetual sign, it's everlasting. Keep it forever, it hasn't been done away with. Verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person, also soul or life, <laughs> shall be cut off. I mean, it's, a, you know, they put them to death. Pretty heavy duty. A person shall be cut off from Israel. Verse 34. It says, So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Verse 39. And they baked unleavened bread, or unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Of course, leavening is a agent such as yeast that causes bread, dough to rise, just like sin puffs one up, like pride. Uh, I got written down here, if you'd like to hear some pre-feast sermons that are excellent, I'd write this down because it's really great. Go to UCG website, and you'll see the sermons column there. You hit it, and then sermon series comes up. Go to the one that says The Two Trees by David Holliday. It's a four-part series. Elaine and I listened to three of them so far. But at least listen to the first one. I mean, it's so excellent. If you want something to chew on, I mean, it's where the rubber hits the road. He talks from his heart, and it's really an excellent uh, excellent message. He talks about the pride of life. So that's something to check out before the feast days come up here. Some sermons to listen to. A side note about Levin and how the Egyptians left Egypt there. I thought, you know, when uh, the COVID epidemic started there, there wasn't only a shortage on toilet paper, there was al also a shortage on yeast. <laughs> And Elaine started trying to figure out how to, uh, she wanted to make some sourdough starter. You know, you can collect yeast from the air. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, too. Like, yeast is like sin, and it's just floating around in the air. And you can collect it, but I was just thinking, I wonder how long it takes for that 
sourdough starter to actually work, so I just Googled it, of course. How long does it take to make a sourdough starter? First thing pops up, bold letter, seven days. I thought that was kind of interesting because the feast is seven days. And then uh, there was another question there, do you have to wait seven days for a sourdough starter to work? And it said, do not attempt to use your starter to bake a loaf of bread until at least day seven. It just won't work. You might see a lot of activity in the first few days, but, you're, but what you're observing is bad bacteria, good bacteria, and yeast all fighting over one food source, your flour. I just thought that was kind of interesting. I uh, thought you could make a message out of that, the good bacteria, bad bacteria, the sin, the yeast, the flour. I don't know, there's something there. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Anyway, God named it appropriately. In Leviticus 23, in verse 6, he calls it the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in Acts 12, 3, he calls it the Days of Unleavened Bread. Sometimes the Jews called it the Feast of the Passover. The Passover over themes carry over to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're supposed to, or expected to, imitate Christ. So let's look at his example in the New Testament. If you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 and verse 41, it says, the boy Jesus amazes the scholars. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, like I mentioned, the Jews called it the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. So it says that Jesus was keeping the feast there when he was 12 years old as a boy. He also kept it with his, his family there and later with his disciples. If you turn back to Matthew 26, back a few pages, Matthew 26 and verse 17. Matthew 26, verse 17, says Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So a couple examples of Christ keeping the Passover as a boy and as a young man. The earliest instructions for keeping the feast were given to the Israelites, of course, back in Exodus, as they got ready to leave Egypt, I want to go back. I should have told you to hold your place. If you want to go back to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12, verse 14 through 17, says, So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Verse 16, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought you your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. So the Israelites were told to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to remind them of how God freed them from slavery and brought them out of the land of Egypt. In the same way we observe the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread each year, we should remember that Christ shed blood and sacrifice delivers us from our sins and helps us with difficulties and trials that we go through. <clears throat> 
Let's look at a couple of miracles that Christ performed to expand on the teaching about leavening and the meaning of the feast. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12. Matthew 16, 5 through 12, the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I remember Dan gave a message on that one time. Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Verse 10, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up. How is it you do not understand that I do not speak of you concerning bread, but to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrines or the teachings of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So Christ didn't have a lot of good stuff to say about the Pharisees and Sadducees. You can see in verse 3 there, he calls them hypocrites. Verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation. You know, he didn't didn't care a lot about uh, how they how they dealt with things or their doctrines or teachings. The, Ver the Pharisees and Sadducees thought they had it all together. If you go to Matthew 23, we can check that out. Matthew 23, verse 27. Matthew 23. Verse 27 and 28. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. You indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inwardly you are full of What's it say here? I'll get it right. Dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. You know, Christ uh, pretty much lays it out, calls them a brood of vipers in different scriptures also. Christ didn't have a lot of good things to say about Sodom. They looked good to people on the outside, but on the inside, they were full of hypocrisy, lawlessness, Christ did not want his disciples to learn their doctrines or their teachings. So, something to think about. The days of unleavened bread remind us to remove and avoid all types of sin in our lives symbolized by leaven. And we can do it with God's help. Paul also taught some of the same lessons as Christ did in correcting the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians, if you want to go there. First Corinthians five. First Corinthians five verses six through eight. It says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So that's what we learn here. We 
learn from God's Bible the truth, learn in sincerity and truth. The Corinth church had some issues. They had sexual immorality, they had divisions and jealousies. They were keeping the feast all right. They were moving the leaven from their homes. They were keeping the feast physically, but Paul wanted them to understand the spiritual intent. God wants us to examine ourselves. What sins and shortcomings do we need to overcome with God's help? Turn up to second, or back to 2 Corinthians 13. We hear about this every year. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. You know, God's very merciful to us, and we go to him with a repentant attitude and ask for forgiveness, and Christ's blood and sacrifice covers those sins, and we can continue to go forward. God's given us the Holy Spirit to help us to see ourselves. We can repent and overcome our sins and shortcoming with God's help. Galatians chapter 2 Galatians 2 and verse 20 It says I have been crucified with Christ It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, do we have the faith that Christ shed blood, covers our sins, and we can continue to go to our Father in heaven for a repentant attitude and ask for forgiveness? These seven days of the feast help us to recommit, to draw closer to God and Jesus Christ. Just as God delivered the Israelites from enslavement to Egypt, he also delivers us from enslavement to sin. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 through 18. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and its lusts. And do not present your members as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are under What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace certainly not Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one's slaves whom you obey whether to sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness You know, what a blessing it is that we have God's truth and God's Holy Spirit. You know, we're bought at a price. You can look, we can read about that in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6 and verse 19 through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom, you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. 
Therefore glorify God as your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, so that's awesome. I love those scriptures. I forgot if it's Isaiah or Jeremiah where it says, you know, God says, you are mine. I'd rather be nobody else's <laughs> in this day and age. As we do physical things, we can learn spiritual lessons. As we live in our homes this year, let's think about what we are doing. Ask God help, to help us see our sins and the power to overcome them with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But it also says it is God who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. God freely gives us all the help we need. He gave his son that we have our sins forgiven. We can be unleavened and cleansed of sin. Let's continue to work on getting sin out of our lives with the help of God's Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. And again, I encourage you to check out that sermon because it's very good. <laughs>